All right. So our first session for today is a presentation on the state of blockchain by Garrick Hallman, uh, our analyst at Coindesk and economic historian at the London School of Economics. Please welcome Garrick. Good morning. Thank you for, uh, for having me. Um, so today I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to provide a, a general industry overview first, talk about kind of the Bitcoin and blockchain industry before giving in, going into our state of Bitcoin, which is our quarterly report uh, that we release on Coindesk.com every quarter. And then we'll talk last about the state of blockchain. So first, the general industry. Let's start with uh, the good news. And again, I'm just going to kind of try to set the table for today with some general information, um, which I think you'll find useful for our discussions today. So the good news for the industry is that as of Chain's recent deal, we've raised uh, $894 million in total venture capital uh, by Bitcoin and blockchain startups. Uh, and this is really a global phenomenon. There's 23 countries, actually, that now host a Bitcoin uh, VC-backed startup. Um, so this is very much a global, global industry. Uh, to put that VC number in perspective, we compared it previously with uh, the Internet and how much uh, money was raised in the early stages of the Internet. So looking at last year's figure, 2014, 362 million uh, Bitcoin venture capital. Um, that compares really well to the amount of money raised uh, during the 1995 internet year for early stage VC companies um, of 250 million. Um, that gives you some sense of the size. When people talk that this is as big as the internet, um, you know, the VCs are really walking the talk here with the, with the money they're putting into this. Um, this year looks set to be another great year for venture capital. Uh, year to date, we have $436 million raised uh, compared with 224 uh, as of this time last year. Again, this includes the, uh, the recently announced chain deal, so almost double last year's total. And uh, the largest deal each quarter has been steadily increasing in size. We were seeing 20 to $30 million size deals 18 months ago. Recently, we've been seeing 50, 75. These are all signs of a healthy funding environment. However, the, there are some clouds on the horizon that are a little bit disconcerting. So if we project forward for Q3, uh, we're projecting about 81 million raised this quarter in venture capital, which would definitely be a bit of a down quarter based on recent trends. Um, you know, that could be due to some seasonal effects. It is summer, but uh, that would certainly break with uh, the historical trend here. Um, and if we compare the projection for 2015 to the 1996 internet VC raise, we'll see we're not exceeding the number we're actually about on par. So these are just some, some warning clouds that maybe things, the funding environment is starting to, to soften up a bit, um, but we'll see. We've, we've got rumors of some pretty big deals coming, coming out here real soon, which may change this picture. So let's talk quickly about regulation. Of course, we're in New York. It's a big topic here with the bit license. Uh, there's been 22 applications for bit licenses that have been announced, but I think almost as important a figure as that, as that number is actually the 15 companies that have announced they're actually pulling out of the New York market due to the bit license regulations. Uh, we've got a picture there of a very relaxed looking George Frost. Uh, he's the general counsel at Bitstamp. Uh, that picture probably was taken before he started filling out his bit license application. Uh, he's told us that roughly about $100,000 has been spent trying to, trying to, to get through the bit license uh, process. Now, in all fairness to regulators, I know there's a number of them here in the room uh, today will be at this conference. Um, there are some reasons to be concerned about how this technology is being used. So research recently came out suggesting that uh, the dark market is processing as many transactions, 400 to $600,000, uh, sorry, 300 to $500,000 a day, as all of BitPay's legitimate transactions. Um, so this is a concern. There are real concerns that regulators have given the, the proportion of, of dark market activity with this technology. Um, and I want to assure many people in the industry who haven't uh, met with regulators that they actually are not interested in killing the golden goose that lays you know, the, the good tax aid that drives productivity and innovation in the economy. If you look at their track record of regulators in recent history with you know, the moratorium on the internet sales tax that allowed companies like Amazon to really uh, prosper, if you look at the backing away from regulating Skype as a, as a phone company that would have required them to actually provide uh, access in remote regions. Um, regulators very much get the need to foster a productive, uh, dynamic economy. And uh, I think there is an interest in doing that with Bitcoin. But having said that, I would say another canary in the coal mine that things may be going a little too far 
is the case of Zappo. When you see a really talented entrepreneur and uh, one of the most well-funded Bitcoin startups uh, relocating their legal headquarters from Silicon Valley to Switzerland, um, that's a troubling sign that maybe things have gotten a little, gone a little too far in terms of regulation. So that's a quick, quick industry overview. Let's talk about the state of Bitcoin. Uh, as I mentioned, the state of Bitcoin is a quarterly report that we produce uh, for Coindesk. And uh, we try to you know, count the numbers so you don't have to do the counting yourself. Uh, we also try to do you know, interesting pieces of analysis that we, we haven't seen anywhere else. Uh, I'll give you one, one example of that we'll be featuring in the next state of Bitcoin. We looked at the hundreds of academic papers that have been published on Bitcoin and blockchain over the last few years. Um, some of you may not have known there have been hundreds of papers published. Uh, one interesting finding, just looking at the disciplines that these papers are published in, is it's not engineering and computer science and security that actually leads, as I would have thought was the case. Uh, those disciplines have about 20, 28% of the total publications. It's actually economics, my discipline, that leads at 33%. Um, economists are very much taking an interest in this space, as is the legal profession. 19% uh, of all publications are law, followed by accounting, uh, the environment, politics, and sociology. So that's just an example of the type of uh, fresh analysis we try to produce um, uh, each quarter in the state of Bitcoin. Price is a really popular topic uh, in the media among, among Coindesk users. Looking at the most popular stories, uh, the most read stories uh, in Q3 so far, uh, four of them are price related. Um, so we often lead our state of Bitcoin reports with some commentary on price. Uh, we'll show kind of a, a price chart which reflects some of the key events in, in, in the quarter. And most of you probably know that earlier this quarter there was a, a pretty big spike in the price, um, which was attributed in part to financial turmoil in places like Greece and China. Uh, the price has since uh, fallen off. And uh, this is turning out to be a volatile quarter again for Bitcoin's price. We actually had entered, entered a period of very low volatility. Q2 was the lowest uh, uh, quarter for volatility in quite some time. Um, but what, what can we say about this price move in response to, say, events in Greece and China? Well, it's hard to know what's going to happen in those markets. Uh, but what I can tell you is this. Greece is certainly not alone uh, in having a debt crisis. Uh, there's actually 24 countries that have an ongoing debt crisis right now. Uh, another 14 are actually vulnerable to a debt crisis. And so if Bitcoin's price is starting to move in conjunction with macroeconomic events, um, there certainly is a lot of fodder out there uh, to perhaps um, drive the price uh, further if, if some of these uh, debt situations take off. On the flip side, uh, in a few days, the Federal Reserve is going to be holding a very important meeting to talk about raising interest rates. This is the Fed's uh, dot plot chart where they project forward what they, where they see interest rates going. You can see the dots are all drifting upwards to about 4% roughly is where the Fed thinks interest rates are going to be in the next few years. Historically, um, higher, higher interest rates mean a stronger U.S. dollar, and that's been uh, negatively correlated with Bitcoin's price. So if the, if the dollar does become much stronger, that could be a negative drag on, on Bitcoin's upward price momentum. So let's shift to Bitcoin commerce briefly. So wallets, the number of wallets is one of the measures we use to track adoption. Uh, it's been pretty steady, as you can see, for most quarters leading up to Q3 at about 400, 500,000 new wallets added each quarter. We're projecting this quarter actually closer to 700,000. I don't know what's driving that increase. Um, I'd love to hear some thoughts on what's driven the, the big change. Do keep in mind that these are self-reported numbers. There's nothing stopping someone from opening up multiple wallets. Companies may be looking to juice their numbers, but there is a, a change taking place with the number of wallets. It could be for, for legitimate adoption reasons. We don't know. Um, if we look at the payment side, um, you know, companies like Expedia, Overstock, and others have been reporting disappointing Bitcoin payments. I think that's a story we, we all know pretty well. Um, basically, the long and the short of it is uh, Bitcoin makes a lot of sense for merchants in terms of faster transactions, lower fees, no chargebacks. But consumers, especially consumers in places like the United States, uh, Europe, uh, really lack a compelling reason to use Bitcoin still for, for legitimate transactions. Um, part of the reason I think overall we're seeing kind of Bitcoin payments adoption lag is based on a piece of analysis I, I put out last year called the Bitcoin Market Potential Index. So this index 
uh, tried to look at the drivers of Bitcoin adoption. What were the things that would cause people to actually want to use Bitcoin in different regions of the world? So for example, inflation, uh, history of financial crises, degree of financial repression, size of the remittances market and the cost of the remittances market, uh, the size of the black market, the technology penetration of a particular country, all these things will play into the utility or usefulness of Bitcoin in any given place. And what the index shows is that it's actually sub-Saharan Africa, uh, Latin America, and the post-Soviet Union, those regions are the regions that would have uh, the most reason to actually use Bitcoin, where Bitcoin would have the greatest utility. However, if you look at where Bitcoin businesses are setting up, it's primarily in places like North America and Europe, not in those regions where Bitcoin is actually probably most useful. That's a picture of a year ago. That's a picture of today. It hasn't changed that much. Again, there's still a lot of focus, um, not just on businesses, uh, setting up in places like Europe and North America, but most of the VC-backed companies are in these places as well. Yet Bitcoin is most useful in other places around the world. I think that's a big part of the, the lack of adoption story. So just to wrap up the state of Bitcoin uh, portion of the presentation, I think the industry can take some solace in knowing that switching, getting users to switch to a new payment rail and a new currency is very, very hard. It's not easy to do, and we don't need to look any further than Apple Pay. I think Apple Pay is generally seen as a bit of a success. But the latest numbers show that Apple Pay use is dropping off. So as the buzz around iPhone 6 has started to wane, uh, Apple Pay usage is waning with it. You know, it may pick back up. But it's really, really hard, especially in places like North America and Europe, to get people to use a new payment rail, let alone a new currency. OK, state of blockchain. So we had this wonderful cover of Blythe Masters. Uh, it's going to be on the October uh, 2015 uh, edition of Bloomberg Markets. There is something problematic about this picture, by the way, uh, which I don't have time to discuss here in this presentation, but come talk to me about uh, coffee afterwards. And it's not Blythe or her dress. She looks smashing, doesn't she? Um, but uh, it's all about the blockchain is what Bloomberg's telling us. And Blythe, of course, has been out really you know, as a Pied Piper, talking with Wall Street firms about you know, this is something you need to take as seriously as the internet. And I think these companies are. I mean, there, there isn't a day that goes by where we don't see a, a new announcement about a UBS or uh, a NASDAQ or a number of financial services firms uh, announcing some type of involvement with the blockchain technology. And that's generally falling into one of three categories. Uh, companies are experimenting uh, with, with various uh, use cases on the blockchain, both uh, private ones as well as the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, they're publishing reports and uh, issuing uh, you know, research around the blockchain. And they're also investing in Bitcoin and blockchain startups. These are the three primary ways in which uh, Wall Street is playing right now with this technology. And those are some of the companies that have announced uh, publicly that they're doing these things. So, so blockchain, it's all about the blockchain, right? Well, that's wreaking havoc for me uh, and, and how I, I think of conceptual frameworks for kind of slicing and dicing up the industry. This is our traditional view of, of the Bitcoin ecosystem, of the blockchain ecosystem. You know, we've got companies that are payment processors, exchanges, wallets, miners. We added uh, the infrastructure category and then the universal category when we saw, in the case of universals, companies like Coinbase looking to uh, play in multiple areas of this value chain. That's our traditional model, but it, does it really work still with this kind of like shift to blockchain? Is it, you know, it's all about the blockchain. Where's, where's the blockchain in that? How does that fit? So we're thinking about how to um, basically you know, look at the ecosystem. And one possibility is to start to think about it from, say, a currency and non-currency perspective. So companies that are engaged in currency activities, and I think good examples of these are BitPay and Circle, are focused primarily on currency right now. Um, would be one, say, bucket of companies. Another bucket would be, say, your non-currency companies. Factum, for example, got a lot of press about its uh, working with Honduras to put land registry on the, on the blockchain. And then you've got hybrid, hybrid companies that are doing both. And I think Ibit's a great example of this. You know, they were first well known for their exchange. They've now announced their bank chain product. Um, the question is, are we going to be seeing more companies shifting from, say, currency into the hybrid model? you know, moving that direction, and if so, is this the new framework by which we want to think about the industry? Do we want to think about it from a permissioned versus permissionless perspective? That'd be maybe another framework. Come talk to me 
uh, get in touch if you have views on how we should be conceptualizing uh, the industry structure. If we did look at it from a currency and non-currency perspective, here's how the numbers look. About 70% of the funding in companies, 70 to 80%, uh, are engaged in currency activities. About 30% roughly, you could call, say, blockchain companies that are either hybrids or, uh, or strictly focused on non-currency activities, both in terms of the level of VC funding on the left and the, uh, the number of companies on the right. So still, the industry is very much dominated, I would say, by currency activities so far. So to wrap up, um, we're going to hear a lot today about the various use cases uh, of blockchain technology. Um, I think this impossible to read diagram uh, is, I didn't put this up for you guys to try to read this. I just wanted to make the point that there's a lot of potential use cases, oodles, and uh, I think this speaks very well to that. Um, one use case that I'm particularly excited about is the um, opportunity for macroeconomists to use blockchain te technology to solve at least two of the three big problems that are our uh, discipline faces. Um, so the reason macroeconomics gets it wrong uh, so often is uh, we have very poor data, and that data is often changing and re revised regularly. Uh, the uh, understanding of cause and effect is, is limited in the economy. And third, the economy is always shifting. It's always changing, right? We didn't have iPads 10, 20 years ago. So issue number one, imagine moving you know, a lot of economic activity onto a blockchain. You could access that economic activity in real time, be much more reliable, it's all digital. Um, issue number two, cause and effect. We could run experiments using agents on blockchain models, I think much more easily than we can today with our, our kind of more distributed economy. Issue number three, I'm not so sure about. The, the continuing shift to the economy, I'm not sure how blockchain helps us with that, but if you have ideas on that, um, I'd love to hear them. But anyway, just to wrap up, there's a lot of potential use cases for blockchain technology. Uh, we hear, we're going to hear a lot about those. The next piece of research that I'm working on, and if you're interested in this, I'd love to talk with you, is to actually do something similar to what I did with the Bitcoin Market Potential Index, where I rank countries by utility. What I want to do is I actually want to rank uh, these different use cases uh, by the size of the opportunity. So kind of a blockchain market potential index, if you will. And I'd like to do an analysis that looks at things like cost of existing ledgers or databases, the speed of those databases. Um, what kind of competition is there in the market, uh, in the industry? What alternatives exist to blockchain? Uh, the size of the market is obviously very important. And then any other barriers to, to adoption. These are some of, the, I think, the kind of variables that you could use to construct a, a blockchain market potential index. And if you're interested in working on something like this with me, please do get in touch. Um, so that's all the time I have. I want to thank you very much for, for listening, and I look forward to meeting you today.